Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, special meeting of Finance and Corporate Services. Uh, we are going to get right into it. Uh, we have, at present, uh, seven delegates registered for this evening. If anyone uh, here intends to speak and has not yet registered, you, if you could make your way down to Emily over here, and uh, she'll take your information and we'll add you into the, into the list. Uh, the way the evening goes is uh, this is uh, typically uh, an opportunity for uh, residents to provide feedback about anything that has to do with the budget uh, to, uh, to this committee so that we can make uh, as informed a decision as possible on uh, January 23rd when we deal with the final budget. Uh, to that end, typically we uh, adjust uh, the way that we handle these meetings um, in relation to the number of questions that we ask. Uh, and I understand that all the delegates that have registered ahead of time are aware of these rules and, and that, we're, that we're looking at implementing. So at this point, I would take a motion uh, to that effect, and I see Councillor Schneider is in the queue. Thank you, Chair Davey. Uh, the purpose of uh, this evening's public session is to listen and for you, our citizens, to be heard, and being that we have a duty to get to our delegates in a timely manner, I move that members of Council be limited to one five-minute period of questioning per delegate and that the questions be limited to those of clarification. Thank you. I will take that and that does cut our effective time in half per members of council. Uh, Councillor Fernandez, I have been in the queue. I, I just, as a heads up, I don't want to discuss this at any length because delegates are waiting to speak, but Councillor Fernandez. This is not um, what you had originally direct, uh, sent as a motion to council, is it? Uh, I believe that it is, yeah. It's uh, between, we have seven uh, members registered, so the intention originally was if there was five or less, there would be no restrictions at all. If there was between five and ten, we would cut our time in half, um, and if there was more than ten, we would not ask any questions at all. And in all instances, the questions really should be of clarification, because it's a public input session listening, not introducing council ideas. Okay. Okay, I will take a motion on that. Uh, those in favor? And Mr. Opposed? Chairman, I got a point of order. Okay, uh, Mr. Drewitz. Ask, ask, ask to the procedure. Mr. Drewitz, you haven't, you, it's not your opportunity to speak, okay? Uh, sorry, can I see those again? Uh, those opposed? Just those opposed? Okay, one opposed, very good. Mr. Drewitz, when it's your opportunity to speak, you can discuss any issue that you like. I have you listed on the agenda, Thank okay? Thank you. Okay, uh, beginning with Mr. Hagee, you're gonna walk us through some of the uh, public engagements to date. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so just a few brief comments to bring Council up to date on what we've heard so far. As Council is aware, the City posts all of its budget information on its website and it's available to all. And the City also offers a number of different engagement opportunities uh, for citizens. And these are meant to cover different engagement preferences as well as demographics. Some of the examples include making a presentation here tonight to, citizen, or to Council, responding to Facebook tweets or Facebook posts and, and tweets, uh, written submissions, whether it's traditional mail or email, phone calls to a dedicated budget phone line, communication with individual councillors, or using Engage Kitchener, which is the city's online engagement tool. For 2017, the primary vehicle for bu public input so far has been Engage Kitchener. This online tool includes links to all of the 2017 budget documents, as well as a survey focused on three themes, budget awareness, infrastructure replacement, and the 2017 budget itself. As of last Wednesday, a total of 160 people had viewed the budget information online through Engage Kitchener, with 40 people providing responses to the survey. All the feedback received to date is highlighted in the issue paper, uh, BD13, and that was updated and circulated to Council last week. Those are my brief comments, Mr. Chair, and I'll turn the meeting back to you. Thank you, Mr. Hagg. We appreciate that. Okay, before we get to the first delegate, as I'm sure you've, you've all been advised that there is a five minute uh, time limit, but I know that some of you may have had your presentations timed perfectly. Please don't be overly concerned about making that five minutes right on. If you need a little bit of extra time, uh, please go ahead. We will have a timer here just to keep you, to keep you in, in, as a reminder. Uh, but again, we don't, don't feel the need to rush in any way. We will take as much time as needed, okay? So the first uh, delegate of the evening is Mr. Uh, David Marskell from the museum. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'll try to come in well under five minutes. Uh, I was here, as you recall, on December 5th and made a presentation um, and uh, the council asked a number of questions and then sought some more information from staff. So I didn't want to take a lot of time now, but just to um, 
remind you of that. I'm here to answer any questions. But since I have your attention, since we last met, December 5th, uh, we opened Ex Novation, a local artist show. It's the second time that we've done this. It opened over 200 people last Thursday night, which was wonderful. Uh, we hosted a New Year's Eve wedding um, in the museum and on King Street, as you can see there. And uh, we welcomed Tricon on the weekend. Uh, we had a lot of people there uh, dressed up, some great speakers and so on. It was wonderful. And uh, we've launched our 2017 celebration, which has about uh, four different exhibitions and a number of different programming aspects to it. And we're looking to fundraise for the uh, 60 by 40 foot Canadian flag to unfurl on February 28th as the Canadian Games, Canada Games uh, Selection Committee goes by. Um, and as I left you the last time, uh, we're inch inching towards sustainability and uh, we're looking to work, as the final point there says, with the City of Kitchener to close the gap. So again, we went through an awful lot the last time in terms of conversation and you sought some information from, the, uh, from staff, so assuming you have it, I don't know if I can help in any other way. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, we have one person in the queue, Councillor Singh. Yes, just very quickly, Mr. Chair. Uh, David, there's no question that the museum adds uh, that extra bit of excitement to our downtown core and the vibrancy of uh, what we try to establish and encourage. Uh, with the additional request that the museum is doing, what more do you think you can do? And has there been asked for increased funding from other orders? Uh, um, other, you know, the, the, the different municipalities in the region as well, if you could highlight on that. Yes, we did receive an increase from the region. Um, City of Waterloo is in, uh, I believe they uh, make a deci decision for several years, so that one is done for now. Um, and the 1% increase that is being uh, suggested uh, by the City of Kitchener, we're, we're hoping to take that from $1,200 increase, first time in seven years, to about ten or 12000 is what I heard the last time I was here. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Vibinovich. Thank you, and uh, thanks for coming in, uh, David. Two quick questions. Number one, you referenced 90,000 uh, patrons, of which about 40,000 were from out of town. Have you been able to ever do a economic sort of spin-off analysis? I know the province has it for festivals and so on. I don't know if they do for yeah. museums. When we do get out of town guests, what that means from an economic spin-off point of view? Uh, two quick points. We, we have always marketed both uh, in market and out of market and we've been quite successful bringing people to the community. It was something I identified early on when I first got here that we could bring people here from London for example. They don't have to go to Toronto for a great uh, dinosaur exhibit or a Warhol exhibit. Um, and so we do have uh, a lot of marketing outside of the region in partnership with the Toronto Star recently. Um, and your, the second point is that the province we have three years ago went through, I think it's called TREM, and it's a tourism uh, marketing assessment. You give them all your attendance and your postal codes and other data, and they tell you, and I think it was $23 million of positive economic impact the last time we did that. Okay, great, thank you. And then the other question was you referenced, um, I think, a reach out to the province and, and the feds. Have you received provincial or federal funding in, in the past, uh, and uh, are you pursuing that, that right now? So the money from the City of Kitchener I don't believe is operating money. It, it's coming from what was the CI, CEI money. Um, we're not eligible at the province and the, and, the, and the federal government because we don't have a collection as a museum and they don't deem us as an art gallery even though we arguably do both of those things. From time to time we have uh, project funding that we're successful with. Okay, great. That, that's helpful. And I'll, and I'll just uh, let you know that uh, today we, we, the, the finance minister has been in town doing consultations and we did actually um, raise the issue of arts and culture funding and Thank mention you. places like the museum as something that they should be looking at. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Fernandez. Yes. Um, thanks, David. Um, one of the things you had mentioned in your presentation was about sustainability and that you've been working towards that. You, can you just give us and maybe the general public that are here a general understanding of where, how you see that playing out in the next few years um, compared to maybe some other organizations? Um, I believe compared to other organizations, I believe we're in a bit of a growth mode, which is both positive in that our attendance has grown 40% in the last three years, uh, but 
the capacity of the building, I believe, is holding us back from sustainability or will um, in the future. Um, sorry, what was the first question? Would it, would, like, do you have some concrete plans that you have yeah, in sorry. place? So we have a restricted fund that um, makes up any annual deficit that we have. So we don't have a debt. Um, the challenge right now with the markets is that we're starting to um, encroach into that capital, which is not a good thing. Um, our board has taken, I'm sorry I put this slide down, but our board has taken a number of steps to um, invest in our development area. And we have three staff now, for example, and we only had one before. Um, so we're doing, uh, we have a very strategic board, and so we're working to close that annual gap. Um, and at the same time, and I think we've kind of done this um, as much as we can, we've cut as much as we can. And as I said last time, our staff salaries, for example, are about $70,000 less than they were five years ago. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marscal. There are no further questions. I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Okay, up next uh, from Cunitech, we have Mr. Klugman and Ms. Peters. Or perhaps just Mr. Klugman. <laughs> Um, Chair Davey and members of council, thank you very much for having me here today and have the opportunity to speak about uh, some of the things that we're doing. Um, as, uh, as many of you know, um, Community Tech was founded 20 years ago um, by a group of individuals. Um, it was in an age of black and white, apparently. But uh, founded 20 years ago by a group of people who came together with a commitment and an idea to, big, to build something big and something remarkable um, and to not leave the future of their community to fate, but to try and engineer uh, an innovation economy. Very similar story to hear about many of the great things that have happened in this community, always beginning with people rallying together around a bigger cause. And people often ask us what it is that we do, and it's interesting that we believe that we are um, many things, uh, but most importantly, we're, we're a promise to the companies in this community that we're here to help. We're here to help them start and grow and be wildly successful. Um, we're, we're a pact, we're a group of people who came together with a commitment, starting with 43 people, now over 1,100 strong. We're definitely a place, the Community Tech Hub is the clubhouse, the center of gravity for entrepreneurship and innovation in our community. And we're programs, we're hands-on programs to help people find customers, raise capital, hire people, and do what they need to do with their companies. And then finally, we're big believers in and, and supporters of the team effort in this community called building a strong ecosystem, and that's about making sure that, that all the assets necessary uh, are in place to ensure that companies can go everything from starting to going public. And as you recall, we came here in 2009, we had some big goals. Uh, City Kitchener was the first investor of $500,000 that we went out and leveraged. And we had these big goals of being able to help over 100 companies and thousands of jobs and bringing in $100 million in investment. And as you can see, since 2009, we've been wildly successful, far more successful than any of us had ever hoped in being able to kind of have, kind of have the kind of impact that we've been able to have. And even within the last 12 months, when you think about what we've been able to do and the contribution that companies in the community have had, we can see almost 1,000 companies being serviced by our organization over the last 12 months. And where are we going? Well, we often talked about uh, Waterloo Region as being, our goal being uttered in the same breath as Silicon Valley, and of course we've achieved that. Um, and now what we see is the opportunity is to be able to rival the valley, to be an alternative to the valley. And there's a few sort of five key things that we're focusing on between now and 2020, and that's to make sure that we sustain the momentum of the startup community, get behind uh, scale-up companies, and drive a very strong corporate innovation program. We're going to have a couple of areas of priority where we see a big opportunity for this community, and the big one is really around Internet of Things and big data. With the investment last year of $300,000, we were able to do some remarkable things, adding more SMEs to our, our organization, to being able to launch some very specific accelerator programs such as Fierce Founders, which is the first female uh, founder uh, accelerator in Canada, and of course Community Tech Rev, which is focused on sales. We were also able to, to add another seven corporation labs to our community. And of them, uh, you know, these are net new organizations which have made a commitment to Kitchener, a commitment which is often 
a starting point for growth within this community. And the money that was allocated from the city of Kitchener went to exactly what we said it was going to, which was going to be to do the renovations necessary to allow us to fast track. This year, we're asking for an additional 300,000. And really what we're focusing on is how can we accelerate the pace at which we bring in large corporate partners? How can we go from 14 corporate innovation outposts at the Cunitech Hub to 25 quickly? Um, these are important because not only do they establish outposts here as opposed to in the valley or elsewhere in Canada, but they are often the toehold to expansion into our community as we've seen with Manulife and TD and Canadian Tire. They start with an innovation outpost and then they grow a bigger footprint elsewhere in our region. We're also very excited in the longer term of the opportunity of working with the city on developing a civic innovation lab. So that's our presentation today. I wanted to again thank the opportunity that we've had to work with you over the last number of years. Uh, the initial investment by the city of Kitchener, we went on to leverage with over $100 million investment coming from other levels of government and the private sector. And our partnership has allowed us to do things and have successes as a community beyond our wildest belief. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klugman. There are a couple uh, people in the queue with questions. Uh, if you don't mind as well, uh, if we could get uh, perhaps if Council could be submitted a copy of your presentation. We could look after it as well. We appreciate that. Uh, Councilor Fernandez. Thank you, Mr. Klugman. Um, so I think this is one of your documents that you've got out in the community. And it um, would you say this is your financial document? But it's not very detailed. It's more of a promotional document. It's it's a summary of uh, of, of last year's activities. Okay. Um, we do have full financials available as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so one, one of the questions I had was related to one of the pages in here. It says crushing our goal. And you're, you're indicating that in 2016 you had a 50% private funding, 50% public funding. Previously it was a 38-62. But next or this year you're anticipating it to increase again in public funding and decrease in private funding. Why would that be? No, we're actually tracking to maintain at the 50-50 level. Um, we believe as a public-private partnership, 50-50 uh, split is the right split to have for our organization. Okay, so then this is, was this just a, um, an estimate then? Because in here it says 58-42. Um, it, should, it should be reflective of the fact that the ongoing commitment is to 50-50 uh, okay. well, yeah. revenue so, from public and private. Okay. Um, you just mentioned that you want more outposts in the hub from yes. larger corporations, and you said something about um, it creating a toehold in the community mm -hmm. for a larger, for a bigger expansion. Can you give us a, an example of where something has had a toehold in Communitech and is now um, has their own site with their own, um, instead of just a mobile lab, they've got their own whole lab? Right. Well, with the corporates themselves, of course, we saw TD come in, set up a lab two years ago, um, and within the first 12 months of them being there, making a decision to take space for up to an additional 300 people in the region. Um, we saw Canadian Tire set up their uh, digital garage across the street, which provides space for them to expand uh, their innovation activities in the region. And of course, most recently, we saw Manulife um, take, I believe it's 25 Water Street, um, and add in um, a whole other team focused on a bigger innovation investment in this community, all being based out of the initial investment they make made into the innovation outposts. Okay. Would you mind going back to the chart where you showed um, the investment of the $300,000? Yes. Okay. So you're indicating that um, the funding that we gave you did all of, all of this work? Yes. 113,000 was used for demolition and general contractors? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. I just wanted to have this up a little bit longer so that others can see it. It, it flashed by pretty fast. So uh, essentially what I'm understanding then is you, did you go over budget? No, sorry, you stayed under budget. Yes. By $90. Okay. Yes. All right. That's all I have right now. Very good, thank you. Uh, and uh, Councillor Singh. Yeah, uh, part of uh, Councillor Fernandez's question, and I, I just want to make sure that that's not missed. I think she, uh, she was trying to refer to or trying to get, um, I'm presuming here, 
uh, companies that startups that um, were part of Communitech and uh, they, uh, they graduated out and were able to acquire space and uh, really create a, a larger organization for themselves. Uh, I'm guessing Vidyards and uh, Myovision are just to name a few. Uh, can you name a, any others that uh, have uh, achieved some significant uh, prominence in the community? Um, it's, a lo it's a long list. Um, certainly, as far as companies we've worked with over the last 20 years, there's, it's all of the ones that uh, we know of. Um, since, the, since the Community Tech Hub opened in 2009, um, there's literally been hundreds of companies that have gone through our doors. Um, Vidyard is one who started uh, in, our, in our space, as well as Thalamic Labs. Um, so there's, there's many, many examples of the startups who um, start. Um, the interesting thing is that they start in, in, uh, in, uh, in our space. In our space, I mean both uh, Velocity and Community Tech Hub. Um, and then they move out in concentric rings from that space, no further than line of sight. So um, it's had a huge impact on the downtown core as well. Yes, they have, especially because Salmic Labs and, uh, and Vidyards are, they've co located here in our core. Mm -hmm. So they're taking up space as well as uh, hiring uh, employees. And it's clear to see probably in numbers of thousands of uh, employees have been uh, able to you know, uh, have employment uh, because of the companies that have graduated or come out of been nurtured through Communitech. Is that fair to say? It is, and we actually have numbers on the, the kind of, uh, uh, the numbers of, of, people, of new employees that people have hired based on the strategy. So it's easy to see when you have a very established economy, a manufacturing-based economy that's, you know, dating back 100 years here locally, but as that changes and evolves and you have declining numbers and as pressures change and companies mm -hmm. locate elsewhere, um, the tech sector has really picked up the slack uh, with those declining jobs and provided additional opportunities to supplement. Uh, is it, that's probably fair to say that, that uh, it, that's it, helped our local economy significantly? It, it is, and it's interesting because I think that um, we didn't see a downturn uh, in the, the number of, uh, of, um, of employment levels in the community as, as everyone else went through 07, 08, and 09. Um, and I think the other thing that's happening right now that's very interesting is that we're seeing a rise in manufacturing, and it's, it's, it's exciting because it leverages both the technology capability we've built in this community, um, but also the legacy of being able to build and manufacture world-class uh, here. And of course, we see the rise of so many hardware startups uh, that are manufacturing here in town, and increasingly a number of uh, what we call medtech startups that are sort of the latest um, groundswell yeah. in the community. But it's, it's fascinating to see the, the hardware stuff, which is also a legacy of who we are and now what we're going to be. Well, that's a lot of times the, the misconception when the people think of the tech sector. They, initially, the thought is of coders, mm -hmm. uh, people programming. But it's, it's a lot of it is uh, advanced manufacturing, or a big brunt of it. Now, more of a, so we see the advanced manufacturing side of things. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one thing I don't want to miss out in my short time is that uh, you referenced uh, the partnership that the city of Kitchener has had with Communitech, and I strongly support it because it's not just supporting our downtown or sector of our economy, but this has been a citywide ad uh, advantage and benefit that Communitech uh, has been able to do. With uh, city of Kitchener, uh, uh, continuing on with funding, especially uh, perhaps even doing the uh, Civic Innovation Lab. Now, is that going to be across the city or uh, with the amount of funding that has been provided, uh, we're going to be able to have a foothold at Communitech but not having to pay for service, I the, hope. Yeah, there would be no cost associated with that. Good. Glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Verbenovich. Thank you. And Ian, thank you for, uh, for coming in tonight and for the, the great work that you and your team can continue to do at Communitech. Just on the issue of digital outposts, and I know uh, you, you touched on the three that have moved out in, into expanded space, but the rest of them, I mean, we're talking these are national and global companies, and they're not just employing one or two people uh, in there. I'm wondering if you can just sort of touch on average number of people that, that they're employing. And I guess I, I look at one like Post Media, which I think is one of your more recent ones. They've had a fairly quick trajectory in hiring. Maybe you can share that with council. Yeah, no. Um, so we see them um, uh, hiring between um, sort of 10 and I think the largest is 17 um, people. And that's a mix, usually 50-50 full-time staff, and then the other half is, uh, is co-ops. Um, Post Media has ramped up. I'm not even sure exactly how many people they've got right now, um, but it was a very quick ramp up. The, the, uh, the, the, the exciting part in this is that we're competing with other major jurisdictions that would have normally been 
where global companies would establish uh, their innovation initiatives. Um, and we're, we're winning them here, not only in this country, but also in this community. And once we find that people um, have a sense of, of this community, um, they want more. They want to stay, they want to grow, they want to build. Um, one of my favorite quotes is they asked the global chief technology officer of, uh, of General Motors um, if uh, why he was not, why they had not invested in the valley. And he said, we found something better. It's called Waterloo Region. Excellent. That's certainly encouraging to... Uh to, uh, to, to hear. The, the other question I have for you is just in terms of, um, you know, the contribution that the city makes towards your, uh, you know, the work that you've done as opposed to the, the province and, and the feds. Um, my sense is, from the things I've looked at over the years, um, our small investment gets leveraged many times over mm -hmm. uh, in terms of provincial and federal investment as well as private sector. Um, a, you can confirm that, and then B, just how important is that um, is that municipal commitment when you actually are going knocking on the door of the provincial and federal government? Yeah, so we believe, in, I, we, believe uh, we have a about $60 million investment from the federal and provincial government that was leveraged from the initial investment by the city of Kitchener, and then in addition to that, approximately an equal amount from the private sector. Um, the, 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 the municipal number, number money is very, very important because, because it sends a signal that this is a priority for this community. Um, and when governments are trying to decide where they're going to invest, and they hear lots of voices about what's important and what's not important, they do look and say, you know, do you have the support of your own community? Is your municipality investing in this initiative? It doesn't have to be on equal terms as the province or the federal government, but it really does send a very important message. Um, to, uh, to all the other funders that this is a priority. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair Davey. Uh, Ian, you mentioned uh, the ability to go from, uh, or the hope to go from 14 to 25 larger outposts. And this might be a tough question, but is there like a guesstimate at some of the economic benefit, the jobs that that might create if, if this can happen? Now, we have some research which is done by Deloitte on an annual basis, and it looks at the economic impact of the tech sector, which this past year they estimated to be about $1.7 billion. Um, but we don't have specific uh, estimates as far as the corporate innovation component yet. Um, it's a relatively new program, and it is something that we should look at being able to identify because it will have long-term benefits, obviously. Thank you. And uh, lastly, we have Councillor Ioannidis. Thank you, Chair Davey. <clears throat> thanks, Ian. Thanks, Aubrey, for coming in. And thanks for uh, providing uh, this, the detailed information in your presentation. It speaks a lot on, on all the great work that you're doing. Uh, my question is relating to the opportunity about what the city is going to have with creation of, of a civic innovation, innovation lab. I'm just wondering if you can just give us a perspective, since you're here, how significant that is. Um, I think it's significant in the fact that, uh, you know, personally, I've spent uh, an equal part of my life and my career working in the private sector and the public sector, and, and I am a, a big believer in public service. Um, and so this model is very interesting um, because it allows us to play a role in helping iconic Canadian big corporations not get disrupted. But the exciting part from my perspective is really the opportunity to take this model and apply it to the public sector. And so, of course, we have got LCBO, which is our first public sector uh, partner who's set up a lab. Uh, we have two others that are coming in as well. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity for all of the organizations, and this is the opportunity that we see in co-locating all these different uh, entities together, to learn from each other. Um, the specific thing that we see as far as the opportunity for the, the city as an in, a civic innovation lab is um, A, docking with the startup community, have a first-hand sense as to what is emerging, what people are working on, um, an opportunity to uh, influence that by being clear about the challenges that the public service is facing. Um, being a first customer of, uh, of companies in the community can, can not only benefit them, but can also benefit the, the city as, as, from effectiveness perspective. And, and the final thing, I think, is really changing um, you know, the, the opportunity of, of, a broad, of, a, of engaging with uh, the citizenry of, of Kitchener in a different kind of way. Um, we do see civic um, um, 
innovation centers in other communities and this is one of the big things is the opportunity to say come in help us solve the problems we're collectively facing and this is the this is the right place to do it because we don't want to do it where you are and you don't want to do it where they are there has to be this kind of this this place where you know deviance and difference and innovation is encouraged and welcomed that's a very good explanation thank you there are no further questions thank you both for coming in appreciate it thank you Next, we have uh, Lisa O'Connell from Pat the Dog. Good evening, and thank you. Uh, my name is Lisa O'Connell. I'm the Artistic Director of Pat the Dog Theatre Creation. Um, we appeared, my board chair and I, uh, last month at the Arts and Culture Committee, appealing our Tier 1 grant. This is the first year that we've been invited to the Tier 1 program. Um, we're here tonight with a respectful and gentle reminder of our appeal to, uh, to the Finance Committee and with some new information. Um, but first, a little context, if I will, for uh, those of the members who were not present at the Arts and Culture Committee. Um, Pat the Dog, Theatre Creation, we are makers of content. We are the builders of culture. We are professional theatre creation incubator. We make the content for Canadian theatre. We're the only one in Ontario. We are one of ten across Canada. We are a nationally recognized organization. We were founded in KW by myself over 11 years ago. We are a very lean, efficient organization. We have only one full-time staff. We have six part-time staff, four of them that reside in Kitchener-Waterloo. We're so lean, we didn't have a PowerPoint because that's not where we put our efforts. We put it in the making of culture and the making of theatre. We also mentor and incubate new theatre companies, mostly young generation, mostly under 30, mostly grads, or postgraduate programs. I have one of them in the audience tonight, Nicole Smith, who I work with, who are being mentored, and she's creating the first women's theatre company in Kitchener-Waterloo. We walk our talk. We've never run a deficit. We use shared platforms, and our constituency is predominantly, as I say, young generation. Our programming specific to Kitchener-Waterloo is we are the only professional women's playwright unit in Waterloo Region's history. And we also, our larger project is our digital story creation project, the text and tech project, which one of the councillors had a question at, at uh, the last meeting. We look at story creation in digital design. We're the only one in Canada doing that in theatre. Uh, we look to efficiencies at the origin of creation in digital story design. It's specific, it's geeky, it's what we are specialist in. We held an event in November in our partnership with the Games Institute at the University of Waterloo. It was attended by two people from the National Arts Centre in Canada, from Ottawa, who came down to be present at the first of our meetings. The new information I'd like to present tonight is that during the Christmas holidays, we received two very important pieces of information. One is that we are um, a recommender to the Ontario Arts Council's Theatre Creative Reserve Program. For those of you who may not be aware, it is a third-party recommender program by the Ontario Arts Council. Few organizations are asked curatorially. They are given an amount of money anywhere between four and $12,000, and people apply to the organization, in this case, Pat the Dog, and we recommend grants based on curation, based on excellence, and then it is green-stamped or um, uh, green-lit by the Ontario Arts Council. Uh, the maximum amount that you can receive uh, in your allotment is $12,000. We received a 37.5% increase just before Christmas, raising our allotment to $11,000. We're a funder. We understand what it's like to have a lot of people come to you and ask for money. We received 60 applications from across Ontario, representing $180,000 in asks. We could only fund 11,000. We funded 18% of those in Waterloo Region, which was the same amount that we gave the GTA, which was the first time that we did that. Um, we understand process from the perspective of the funders, so please understand that when we bring this to you, we bring you the strongest information based on how we know and how we've been entrusted with building Canadian culture. The second and most exciting piece of information is we received notification just before New Year's Day that we received a performing arts internship from the Metcalf Foundation. The amount is $27,500. It's a full flight for us to fund an internship for Nicole Smith, again in our audience tonight, who is a young generation creator, two years graduated out of the University of Guelph, and has now moved back to this community from Toronto. She's a Cambridge girl, born and raised, to move and work in this community to set up her company. We're a very lean organization, but have provided six jobs, one full-time and now a full-time internship. Let me also point out that the Metcalf Foundation is based predominantly in Toronto. 
They only funded six. We are the only Metcalf Foundation um, uh, receiver of the uh, Performing Arts Internship in Waterloo Region's history. Um, unlike a lot of organizations that come to you, we actually receive most of our funding from the federal and provincial level. We have been rewarded and awarded in our curatorial excellence. We have been told that our work is good. We are funded in this community. We received $4,000 last year from the City of Kitchener. Our increase this year was $40, which gives us an allotment of $4,040. In the first year of the CIA program, Heather Sinclair granted us $10,000. We've received nothing since that very first allocation four years ago. Staff has received no salaries in 10 years. Any funding that I can get for my young generation people comes from the feds or the province. Respectfully, I ask you in our first year of Tier 1 to take a look at something that has been awarded, founded in this company, wants to stay in this community and works in this community to fund us at a level that is more than half a week of our operations. We ask for $10,000. We're not asking for even a third, not even a quarter, and even a tenth of what we're worth. We understand as funders as we are with the Theatre Creators Reserve Program how difficult it is and all of the things towards you. But we believe strongly that we should be receiving at least $10,000, which was the allotment granted us by the, uh, the Creative Enterprise Initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Connie, for your presentation. I'm not, not seeing any, okay, there you go. Question from Councillor Fernandez. Actually, not a question, but congratulations Thank on you. Um, receiving the, uh, the funding from the Ontario Arts Council as well as from the Metcalf Foundation. Thank you very much. Um, I, you know, I, unfortunately, it, it, it <laughs> may not swing in your favor because now we're seeing that you're actually having a little bit more uh, funding, but I understand where you're coming from and I think that, that the work, um, your presentation really speaks to your passion. Um, we'll see how further discussion happens on budget. If I may, it, I, I must point out to you, it's not passion, it's economic reality. I have a responsibility, both nationally and, and uh, both federally and provincially, by the dollars entrusted to me and the investments made by all of the funders who give us this money to create a template and a, the ground for young generation creators, respectfully by funding this organization uh, who's been awarded these awards four thousand dollars saying we don't need the money no one's how to raise we can't do work we work predominantly in kind we are a small small mid-sized arts organization and i prove we're incredibly lean with what we do an additional allotment takes us up to ten thousand we will do a hundredfold uh, and I won't put it in PowerPoints. I'll put it in Canadian culture. I'll put it in work that will reflect and respect this community. I'll put in the stories that will be disseminated nationally and provincially. We're also working across with our, our partners, our 10 other uh, playwright development centres, on an international grant with two major international funders. So our work is now leveraging internationally. Um, it's very difficult for me to make the argument to my young generation creators and also to the private uh, sponsors that we're trying to build here in Kitchener-Waterloo, um, when the city deems to give us $4,000. Uh, I can say what the Fed and the, and the province say, but we're a complete opposite of usually what this community speaks about, is that we don't get our fair share. Well, I get my fair share. We get our fair share representing the work we do, federally and provincially. We do not understand why our, our, our municipal committee hasn't, hasn't stepped up. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. I appreciate the question. And there are no further questions. Thank you kindly for coming in. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. Next delegate we have uh, listed is uh, Mr. Al Hayes from the Chamber of Physician Recruitment Program. Thank you, Chair Davey and uh, members of council. My name is Alan Hayes. I'm a local business person, but also I chair the Physician Recruitment Task Force Committee with the Greater Kitchener-Waterloo Chamber of Commerce. I'm here to request the City of Kitchener's contribution of $10,000 towards the Chamber's uh, recruitment program. Um, also with me tonight is Dr. John Heinzman, uh, Deputy Chief of Staff with Grand River Hospital and St. Mary's Hospital. And uh, they are also requesting $10,000 to assist in the hospital's specialist recruitment programs. In the late 1990s, approximately 40,000 residents did not have access to a family physician. This shortage was seen to be affecting the well-being of the community, and it was especially a concern to the business community because it impacted our ability to attract talented people from outside the area. The recruitment program hosted by the Chamber consists of a dedicated Chamber employee acting as the physician recruitment lead for the area. 
This individual, with the support of many volunteers, provides a range of services to help attract family physicians to our community. We hold an annual physician recruitment weekend in the fall, where between 15 and 25 family physicians training at various medical schools in Ontario are invited to the community and they're showing specific practice opportunities as well as the benefits of living and working here. We assist the partners of family physicians to find employment in the community. We assist retiring physicians to find new doctors to take over their practices. The Chamber has also assumed an advocacy role, both with the Lynn and the Ministry of Health to maintain this community's designation as a high needs area, which enables us to attract foreign trained uh, doctors to the area. This last year, representatives of the local hospitals reached out to the Chamber uh, to see if we could expand the program and include physicians who were training to work in emergency departments. And we were able to host five emergency uh, physician department or emergency department physicians in addition to 18 family physicians. The efforts of the Chamber staff and volunteers over the last 19 years have helped reduce the number of residents without a family physician from around 40,000 to approximately 15,000 today. In that time, approximately 190 new family physicians have set up practice in Kitchener-Waterloo. I would like to say that at some stage the recruitment program will no longer be needed. However, there are a number of factors that suggest that our community will always have to be recruiting family physicians. Firstly, our population continues to grow as it has for the last 25 years. Secondly, it's estimated that approximately one quarter of existing family physicians are going to be retiring in the next five years. New family physicians do not see as many patients as those that practiced um, in years, go, or years gone by. In many cases, one retiring family physician will need to be replaced with two or more new physicians in order to serve the name, same number of patients. Finally, most small and mid-sized communities in the province are faced with similar challenges and we're competing with them for a limited number of available physicians. The municipalities of Kitchener, Waterloo and the Township of Woolwich have traditionally contributed almost 20% of the Chamber's recruitment uh, program annual budget and the remaining 80% comes from the business community and private individuals. The municipal contribution is critical not only in terms of the actual dollars but it also assists the Chamber in leveraging sponsorship uh, contributions from the business community. Given that the, the success of the Chamber's recruitment program has achieved, but also recognizing the challenges that this growing community faces in attracting family physicians, I'm requesting that the City of Kitchener uh, provide its annual contribution of $20,000, $10,000 which goes to the Chamber's uh, recruitment program for family physicians, and $10,000 going to the local hospitals to support their specialist recruitment efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hayes. Uh, we have two people in the moment of the queue for questions. First, uh, Councillor Ioannidis. Thank you, Chair Davey. Thank you, Mr. Hayes, for coming in. Um, it's a great achievement from 1990, from 40,000, 50,000. Uh, that's, uh, that's some significant and great work. Uh, uh, my, my question is, is what are other centers, other municipalities doing uh, to compete against ourselves? Like, what are we looking at here? What are we looking at Yeah, here? like, what are we competing against? Um, well, I will say to you that a number of municipalities, and, and we see them at various recruitment um, uh, events, a number of the smaller municipalities provide uh, financial incentives to family physicians to locate um, locate in a particular community, it could be a signing bonus, it could be a, a free board. Um, a lot of the northern communities are really challenged obviously and, and but we see it all across both southwestern Ontario and eastern Ontario, they do similar things. We don't provide any financial incentives, it's simply I think the goal of our program is to uh, introduce them to the area, uh, make sure that there's a good fit um, it's obviously more than just a job in terms of setting up a practice. We want to make sure that the area suits, you know, where they want to be, um, that it's, uh, that we can support their, their spouse or their partner. And so really it's, it's a, um, uh, it's an education in what it's like to live and work in this area. And the ones that do, I think, ultimately determine that they're, that they're going to set up their practice here are the ones that we want because they've, they've been convinced then that, uh, this is the area for them. Okay. So... 
there seems to be other communities out there that are really pulling, they're not pulling any of their punches to attract these professionals to their communities. The last event that, that uh, we attended, uh, there was, I believe, about 35 other communities uh, in addition to uh, the Chamber's representation uh, all across Ontario competing for the same family physicians. Okay, so some good, good competition. Um, part of your presentation that kind of su surprised me, but um, when... Uh, when a, re a doctor is retiring and, and a new doctor, you need to take, replace them with two. Can you give us just a better explanation as to why that is? Because it'd seem like with better technology, they would, they would uh, and more staff on their side that they'd be able to see more. So, uh, just just want to get a better. Perspective. I think historically, a lot of family physicians, and I'm not going to talk for for all of them, but many of them had uh, patient lists that that might even approach 3,000 uh, patients, and. The way that, that family physicians are being um, taught now, the way that they um, practice in a much more collaborative um, environment, and that's why we've seen the, you know, the growth of the various medical organizations now that, that are very different than, than when it used to be basically a family doctor operating on their own. The province estimates that the average uh, roster number for a, a current family physician is about 1,300. And so you can see that historically with a lot of family physicians who would have been uh, had rosters of 25, 000, or 2,500 to 3,000, replacing them with doctors who are averaging about 1,300, it takes, you know, in some cases two or more um, to replace those traditional doctors. Okay. So it's just been a change in the healthcare program and, and the way that family physicians and, and their organizations operate. Okay, thanks again. Thank you. Next, we have Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair Davey. Um, just so we get a better understanding of what recruitment involves, what, what is done? What activities are done? How do we get the potential physicians to our area? And what well, do we do when they're here? So it's a year-round effort that the Chamber hosts. Um, so, uh, I mean, there are a number of other um, organizations like Health Force Ontario uh, who are basically like a bulletin board. I mean, what they do is, is if you're a doctor looking for a, a location to practice, they basically post openings. Uh, the Chambers program does a lot more. So um, our, our highlight really is the recruitment weekend, which is held in November of every year. And Mayor Verbanovic and, and other councillors have attended that over the years, where basically it gives us the opportunity to bring in a group of, of uh, resident family physicians uh, who maybe not know a lot about the area. Um, we basically take Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to show them the area, introduce them to existing um, you know, family doctors, uh, tour them through the hospitals, uh, meet with their spouses or partners and, and find out what they're looking for because the employment of the, of the partner or the spouse is, is equally as important as the, uh, as the actual physician. Um, so that's really the highlight, but then there's, there's ongoing follow-up. So um, many of the, the family physicians that we tour in November will be um, in maybe their second year and they have another year of, of studies. So we continue the follow-up. Many of them will ask for additional information. Uh, many of them might come back for a tour. And the physician recruitment lead, which is Jenna Petker from the chamber, um, will take the time to tour them around, introduce them to... Um, employment opportunities, whatever they might be interested in. So it's really a, a year-round program. Um, the other is when um, an existing family physician is looking to retire their practice. Uh, in many cases, they will reach out to the chamber and the chamber will work to find a family physician who, or maybe several family physicians who could actually come in, uh, maybe do a locum, which would be a, you know, a part-time scenario and ultimately possibly take over their practice. So there's a lot of, of things that, um, that the, the program does. The, the weekend is really the highlight, and then it's follow-up um, as need be. Okay. And on that weekend, would we uh, put them up in a hotel and, and uh, feed them? So that money then, that part of the money would actually stay in our city anyway? Oh, that's correct, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the program is, is sponsored, as I indicated, uh, numerous uh, business um, organizations as well as private individuals and then the municipal contributions but yes we we put them up in a hotel um, they basically have room and board for the weekend uh, we tour them around and um, and so all of that money really does stay here but it's used to um, basically highlight the area to these 
to these physicians. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There are a few more people jumped in the queue. We have three members of council. Uh, Councillor Etherington. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Hayes. Thanks for coming in, Mr. Hayes. These financial incentives that you're talking about from other municipalities, these signing bonuses, do you know how much we're talking about for a signing bonus? I don't have the details of that, uh, Councillor, uh, uh, because we don't operate in that way, but I obviously if, if they're intended to um, uh, convince somebody to locate in a specific community, they must be enough to, uh, uh, to, you know, to make that decision. And at these events that we go to, it's not common talk about how much is being offered? No, it's not. I think at, at the events that, that we have attended, um, basically it's, it's a showcase of, of all of the communities yeah. that um, do some of the same things that we do. I mean, what's it like to live and work in that particular community? I think if there is interest, um, then there are some further discussions and negotiations that go on after that. And what other incentives are being offered? Do you know? Um, all I have heard is, is signing bonuses and the potential for um, you know, a house to be provided or an apartment or a condo or, or something like that. Maybe it's outside of your area, Mr. Hayes, but provincially, is that legal? Uh, I'm afraid I can't comment on that. Okay. I know it's a fairly common practice. The 80% of businesses, local businesses, that support what you're doing, and it's great work, um, do they include the high-tech companies we were just talking about? Um, there are some high-tech companies that, uh, that are involved, uh, but I would say the majority of them are, are many of the traditional yeah. uh, firms and, and businesses located in the community. But there is some involvement with, and, and we do have, uh, uh, as part of the weekend, Communitech hosts a lunch uh, where we, we bring the family physicians into the uh, Communitech hub and tour them around and show them what is going on, especially because many of the partners and spouses uh, may be interested in employment opportunities in the tech community. That's good to hear. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Fernandez. Uh, yes, thanks for the interesting information. Um, certainly uh, very enlightening to know that our new doctors are not necessarily <laughs> wanting to take on that huge brunt of patient uh, workload that, that our traditional or more mature doctors, shall we say, <laughs> used to do. One of the things, though, that I've mentioned before, and I'm going to mention it again, is my understanding is that there is limited provincial funding for doctors. So there's only a certain number of doctors that are, are, are even allowed to graduate. And that really is part of the challenge, is it not? Uh, that is part of the challenge. Um, I would say that this is why one of the reasons that the Chamber has continued to push the, um, the high needs designation for our particular area because it gives us some additional opportunities uh, to attract uh, family physicians to this community, whereas other communities that don't have that designation, they have tighter limits in terms of um, family physicians that can actually set up practice there. Okay, so it is an important uh, component, I think, of, of us finding family physicians is that that high needs uh, designation is, is critical. So as long as we have that high needs designation, um, we will have the ability to draw more doctors in than, than say, for example, a northern community that may not have that designation? Well, I'm, many of the northern communities do have that designation because they're challenged, but it, it gives us, let's say, additional leverage and additional opportunity to attract family physicians that a community that does not have that designation uh, does not have. Okay. You said earlier that you didn't think that we would come to a time when we wouldn't have to be incentivizing doctors to come to the area. Um, if that cap at the provincial funding level changes um, and that opens up the, you know, more opportunity for doctors to graduate, would you not believe that people would come to this community? I mean, we, we constantly hear of how all the wonderful things that we have to offer. Isn't that in its, in, in its um, entirety? A draw to come to this community? I think that's what historically was thought, um, but the reality is is that there are uh, many uh, resident physicians have different connections to other communities. They grew up there, they have friends there, they maybe studied there, 
And so um, I don't, I think it would be dangerous for us to assume that people will just naturally come here because, you know, of the name that, that uh, Kitchener and Waterloo have. So this is why we believe that it is important. We have to continue these efforts uh, because there is a lot of competition out there. Mm -hmm. And so there is a limited number of family physicians who are the, available. The original request was, I believe, for five years. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay. So now we're going into the sixth year? Yes. We are. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. Thanks. Mayor, Be Mayor Verbenovich. Thank you very much, and uh, Al, thank you for uh, the work that uh, you folks have done for, for years, and, both, and thank you to both you and Dr. Heinzman for coming in this evening. Um, you mentioned in your presentation uh, that there's about a 20-80% split between uh, the public sector contribution and the private sector contribution. Correct. But then you also talked about uh, many volunteer hours going in. Have you ever sort of tallied those up and, and tried to put some sort of value to that? Because I think that's an added component. I, I would have to say we have not. Um, I, I think a lot of the volunteers, just uh, like myself, uh, believe in the program, believe in the Im importance to the community. I will say that on the weekend itself, I mean, we will have anywhere from 20 to 30 volunteers uh, throughout the weekend just uh, assisting and, and helping sort of introduce the community. Um, and then there are other events through the year as well. So, but we have never actually totaled up the volunteer hours that are put to this. But, but I'm guessing based on what you're saying, it would be fair to say that it's probably in the hundreds if you tallied it all up? I would think so. Okay, thank you. And then the, the other um, question I have, and this may be a difficult one to, to quantify, but has there ever been discussion amongst the group um, about what the impact might be to the community if, um, you know, let's say several councils decided not to fund this anymore. Um, do you see it as something that the pub private sector would would uh, do on their own, or do they just come to the table because there is a, a public sector contribution to it? And you know, what do we think the impact would be on on our physician uh, numbers overall if uh, if this program disappeared? That's, that's an interesting question. I would, I would answer the, the last question first. I think if the, if the program disappeared, I think we could potentially find ourselves where we were um, 20 years ago, uh, where there really weren't any efforts um, made to attract family physicians to the community. Um, the area continued to grow, and suddenly we looked around, and, and there was a significant number of people who did not have um, uh, family physicians, and I think that could easily happen again. Um, I think there are a lot of, of local businesses and individuals who are, feel that this is quite important, as I indicated in my presentation. I think the municipal contribution um, just helps leverage it. It shows that we're all in this together. And, and I would say to, you know, to the entire um, uh, council table that one of the comments that I hear, um, I've been involved with this for about eight years now, and one of the consistent comments that I hear every year from the physicians that do visit us is how impressed that they are with the level of support um, from across the community, both municipal representatives, the business community, volunteers. Many of them have gone to other communities and I think participated in various recruitment programs uh, or events there. We get a consistent message that they're very impressed just by the range of support um, that is, is shown to them when they, when they come for that particular weekend. So I, I, I can't really answer your, uh, your question, Mr. Mayor, what would happen if, if municipal support dried up? I don't think it would be a good thing. I think the, the private sector would continue if they feel that it is a, as an important initiative. Um, but it does definitely uh, show the overall commitment of the community towards this particular initiative. Your, your, your comment on the feedback and on the reaction from the the potential recruits is interesting because I think it's a common theme whether we're it seems whether you know we're talking about attracting physicians or attracting new companies we're trying to get to invest here from a tech sector point of view or or other people we're trying to get here often people talk about that spirit of collaboration exactly and I think that's the message that that we carry out and I think it's a message that that uh, plays very strongly when we're trying to attract these doctors thank you very much thank you Councillor Marsh uh, thank you. Um, just a couple questions. Wondering about what d are you finding usually tips the scale in our favor when we do convince uh, family physicians to, to stay here? 
I think there, there are um, great opportunities. There's, there's a lot of um, um, family, I mean, right now healthcare is, is sort of set up in various formats. So there's family health teams and family health organizations and, and various things like that. So those opportunities are there. Um, and many of them are, are very attractive to, to somebody who's leaving school and is ready to, to set up practice. I think what I found more and more is what is equally important is what are the employment opportunities for their spouse or their partner. Um, I think as a family physician, right now you can pretty much go almost anywhere that you want. So other opportunities to, um, um, to assist with finding employment for a spouse or a partner I think is very important and that's a key thing that the, that the chamber can offer just because obviously it's connections with the, uh, with the business community. I think they also just like to see the uh, what I would say the energy and the vibe that is that is happening in, in especially in downtown Kitchener, but in the in the area as a whole, um, you know they they like to see the, the the tech community, they like to see the business community involved, they see the things that are changing and, and growing, mm -hmm. and uh, and many of them, uh, interestingly enough, many of the uh, residents who attend our weekend will come from the University of Toronto Med School, and many of them say we don't want to end up setting up in Toronto. It's, so. So do you uh, sometimes uh, do some feedback, you know, follow-up feedback uh, a year or two after they have settled in the community to, to, to help uh, to, to modify the recruitment to help understand what did draw them in the end and then like, do you get those, those, that data to, to help with the recruitment in the we future? We certainly do a, a survey at the end of every weekend just to find out what they liked about the area and, and the weekend and what they maybe found you know, lacking and so we continually tune the, um, uh, the program and the events to make sure that it's, it's valid and, and current for, uh, for the residents. Yeah. But uh, I think part of it is, is then regularly staying in touch with them because many of them go back after the weekend and they're back in, in their um, studies sure. uh, for maybe another six months or a year. And so it gives us the opportunity to stay in touch with them. Uh, we want to catch them early, get them excited, and then obviously uh, maintain that connection and, and hopefully attract them to, uh, to the area or just find out what their needs are and see if we can meet them. Yeah, so it's great that we have, that it's well supported at yeah. this point and that we can uh, afford to be able to do that. I'm just uh, encouraging that down the road, you know, when we have recruits who've been here a year or two to find out what they are enjoying about our community so that that can then, you know, help convince more people even after our charming time in November. I, I can't believe that people are, <laughs> that November is when <laughs> you choose to have the weekend. It's not, <laughs> it's not uh, you, when I think of our community that I'd want to show it off the, uh, that, that we are the most charming at, in November, but uh, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's mostly because it, it's a slot in the, in the uh, study program oh, okay. at the med schools. That, okay, uh, and enough. otherwise they're very busy and they're just not able to make sure. it. So that's why so we've maybe, chosen that. So then do you, uh, do you one last question, just uh, as part of the weekend uh, of recruitment, do you highlight things like our amazing Kitchener Public Libraries? Uh, do you highlight uh, the night shift festival that, that happens every November uh, and, and other uh, cultural opportunities in our community. That's part of the cell and I think that's part of the message that we carry out. So it's, it's arts and culture, it's education, you know, it's neighborhoods. I mean, some are interested literally in what's yeah. the price of a home or, or a condo in, in town. So we have a range of volunteers who are able to sort of answer those questions. And then part of the weekend is, is actually, uh, we, we put them on a bus and we tour them around the, mm. the community and show them the things that are going on. Um, show them the events that are on, you know, at any given point in time in the community. So we're really trying to sell a, a way of life as opposed to just simply, here's a place to come and practice. So it's a place to, to raise a family more mm -hmm. than anything else. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are no further questions. I'll just comment that I did find it interesting. Um, you mentioned several times how important the um, uh, spouse or partner is uh, in this equation. And I'm going to do my part. I'm going to make sure I'm going to tell my young children to make sure they're only allowed to date or marry a doctor. To keep this community. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and up next, we do have uh, Dr. John Heinzman.
Uh, good evening. Uh, evening. Thank you for having me. Uh, and I'm here tonight in my role as Deputy Chief of Staff for Grand River and St. Mary's Hospital. I'm a child psychiatrist by training. I've been in this community uh, for 14 years. Uh, I did not receive any incentives to come here. I came here uh, because I uh, had gone to undergraduate school here, which I really think is, is one of your biggest recruiters, uh, is the investment in the medical school and the psychiatry uh, and other residency training programs that, that, that are here. Uh, if you, you can show people the area in a weekend, but if you can, you can show them here while you're training them for a year or two or three years, um, clearly they can get a much better sense of what we're all about in KW. Um, the hospitals have the primary role for specialist uh, recruitment. Uh, they've had some excellent successes in the last uh, few years. I'll just draw your attention to them. The internal medicine program, uh, which provides care for the most medically complicated adult patients, uh, both in the hospital setting and in outpatient office clinic settings, has uh, had significant growth uh, through uh, the support. Uh, they have um, opened a general internal medicine service, which has been uh, much uh, uh, helpful to our patients. And they have opened a clinical teaching unit, uh, which then uh, serves to educate and teach our residents uh, and medical students, which then uh, serves as an excellent recruiting. Uh, so that, that's been a great uh, uh, advantage in the last few years. There's also been a spine surgeon who's come to town uh, to do important spinal surgery that was not available uh, before. Uh, there has been investment in uh, physical medicine or physiatry, which is rehabilitative medicine for patients who are injured uh, and need uh, specialized services there in their recovery. Uh, there has also been uh, the uh, just recent addition of a hematologist, a specialist in disorders of the blood, uh, which I've heard since I've been here need for a, for a hematologist, uh, and uh, now that, that lady is actually here practicing. Uh, so that, that's been uh, great for our area on many levels. Uh, further uh, support would assist in additional specialist recruiting in the areas of emergency uh, medicine. Our emergency rooms are, are busy around the clock uh, and need an abundant supply of physicians. Um, so there's almost a constant need for recruiting there. Uh, there is need for a thoracic surgeon uh, in town as well. Uh, a patobiliary surgeon, diseases of the liver and gallbladder and pancreas uh, with quite complicated uh, surgery. Uh, and then, of course, there's almost always a need for a child psychiatry in my line of work, uh, which I will keep working uh, very hard uh, on. So I'll leave open to any questions. Very good. I'm not seeing many in the queue, or actually I'm not seeing any in the queue. I think most of the questions were asked of, of the previous delegation. Um, going once, twice? Nope. Thank you very kindly for your presentation. Very good. Thank you. Okay, we do have, uh, we do have two delegates left. Up next is uh, Mike Bowes. Good evening, Chair Davey and uh, members of Council. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, hear all of our input this evening. Um, I am uh, now former uh, chair of the Kitchener Cycling and Trails Advisory Committee. Uh, as of uh, last Tuesday, I understand the new committee uh, met and has appointed a new chair. Uh, but I wanted to uh, come uh, one last time, sort of in that capacity, uh, to, uh, to talk about uh, the uh, potential to improve uh, the Iron Horse Trail uh, in the southern section. So in um, a, a few years ago, um, uh, Council approved a Iron Horse Trail improvement strategy, and that involved three different phases. Uh, the first phase uh, was the central section uh, around Victoria Park. Uh, and as I understand it, the planning is underway. Uh, our committee has seen some of the designs and we're very excited about uh, the opportunities that are there. Um, it's going to involve uh, widening the trail, adding amenities, um, potential for new trees, better crossings. Um, and the second section, as I understand it, uh, the northern section uh, is uh, being put on hold for the moment because it sounds like the region is going to be uh, doing some uh, water main work uh, along that corridor. Uh, and so there's opportunities to coordinate with, with the region. And rather than us renovating our trail uh, and then having them dig it up again, uh, we're being, doing the prudent thing and uh, getting all our uh, ducks in a row. Uh, and so that uh, brings uh, us to the, uh, the third section, the southern section. Um, and that's actually the part that's closest to our home um, for my family, uh, and 
That goes from Queen Street all the way down to Ottawa Street, uh, and it uh, passes through a number of, I guess you could say, more industrial areas. Uh, it's very close to the uh, Schneider plant, uh, and with uh, the, the former Schneider plant, uh, redevelopment potential that's happening there, and uh, the, uh, because it's basically right in between the Borden Ion Light Rail Transit Station and the uh, Mill Transit S Rapid Transit Station, uh, it has a huge opportunity for redevelopment. Um, I know the planning around Rapid Transit Stations has uh, some big plans for the, the potential for the creek and for the redevelopment that will happen around there. Uh, and so while this part of the trail might be considered sort of the most, I guess you could say, dated looking and uh, uh, run down and uh, there isn't a whole lot to, uh, n not as much uh, tree cover and, uh, and isn't as aesthetically pleasing as some of the other areas. Uh, it uh, really has the potential to uh, catalyze uh, new investment in the area. Uh, and uh, as, as new development happens, I think uh, there's going to be uh, big opportunities for, uh, for that trail actually to be attracting uh, people to come and live and work in that area. Um, we do know that it's uh, basically the Iron Horse Trail is the cornerstone of our active transportation network in the in the in not just the city but in the region. Uh, it forms part of the Trans Canada Trail leading up into Waterloo, and uh, connecting routes go all the way down into Cambridge uh, and uh, beyond Cambridge to. Uh, to uh, Paris and to eventually to Hamilton if you follow the rail trails far enough. Um, so, and, and we see that this is, is a trail that gets used year round. You know, the, aren't, we've put counters on the trail um, and so we're seeing in, in, I think the city has real time information on how many people are using it. Uh, numbers are down in the winter but there's still people walking and cycling and uh, the, the winter maintenance on this trail has been great. I think uh, by improving it, we're going to see more people will uh, have the opportunity to be active and to uh, travel in uh, whatever manner they choose. Uh, and that uh, hopefully, you know, since this is the central part of the network, we'll, we'll see uh, great trails uh, throughout the city uh, as a result of the example that uh, Iron Horse Trail is set. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bose. There is uh, one person in the queue, Councillor Fernandez. Hi, Mike. <clears throat> thanks for coming in, and um, thanks for your, your years of service on the Recycling Committee. Um, you certainly had a passion that really galvanized our, our committee. So <clears throat> help the people who are sitting here and anybody who's watching understand the importance of the Iron Horse Trail improvements, because people are going to say, well, we need to improve our roads. We've got to get you know, uh, ability for people to be to drive to work and to school and, and, and to activities. But help us understand why this is so important. Okay, Th thank you for the question. I think um, uh, part of the reason it's, it's so important, A, is we're seeing, um, you know, in some sections, uh, there's a thousand people a day crossing, uh, I think, um, we're, we're seeing several thousand people a day in total uh, using the trail um, all the time. Uh, but uh, for, for this particular section, um, I believe it's about two to two and a half meters wide. Uh, the asphalt is decaying. Um, the uh, crossings aren't well marked. Uh, and in the case of Cortland and Sterling, uh, it, it's actually you know a bit of a hair-raising experience trying to... Uh, to uh, get uh, cr diagonally across basically that intersection from one trail section to the other. Um, and, you know, especially with, uh, with light rail happening in the area, we wanting people to be able to get to the stations actively and that uh, our active transportation connections will be important. Uh, but going back to the, the width, actually, uh, there's, and the, the trail crossings, there's actually an accessibility component to this uh, in that, uh, you know, we have... Uh, guidelines now from the province, uh, both in terms of cycling and in terms of, uh, of uh, giving people with mo all kinds of mobility uh, capabilities uh, the opportunity to uh, travel calls for um, at least three meters and I think 
uh, for a trail with, with this kind of level of traffic, actually uh, 3.6 meters is the recommendation, recommended width. Uh, and so that will you know, allow more people to be able to enjoy the trail, enjoy it safely, uh, be able to uh, cross the intersections uh, without you know, <laughs> wandering into the street without realizing it. Um, and uh, for cars to be able to uh, see that they're approaching a trail crossing and, and various improvements like that. So what I'm hearing from you is you see this as a major commuter trail, that it's not just recreational. Uh, you know, it, it serves a uh, multifaceted uh, purpose. And would you say from all your experience on TriTag and on the cycling committee that we get more bang for our buck when it comes to the dollars put to a trail like this than maybe we would for how much roadway we would be able to do? I, I think that's certainly the case. I mean, the uh, maintenance costs for, uh, say, an arterial road, I think the all-in costs are about $20,000 a year per linear kilometer. Uh, and I, I don't have figures for our trails, but uh, I'm assuming that uh, um, that uh, would be the case, or it would definitely be a whole lot lower of a, a maintenance cost because you're not seeing the same kind of wear and tear what you would with trucks and heavy vehicles traveling along it. Uh, so in, and in terms of investment in the community, uh, active transportation industry actually tends to create more jobs per dollar than, um, than road infrastructure does. Thank you so much for coming in and for your answers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Marsh. Uh, thanks, Mike, for coming in and for your dedication, putting your your uh, baby to sleep while you're <laughs> waiting for your turn. Um, I want to just ask you, so have you had a chance to provide this specific feedback uh, within the scope of the Parts Rockway uh, consultations? The yeah. Yes, a few weeks ago I attended actually an open house that was held. Yeah. Uh, and this trail and a number of others that uh, were proposed or would connect with this and various different active routes sort mm -hmm. of radiate out from it. That's right. uh, from this particular section. Uh, and so it would facilitate getting people to, for instance, the Borden station, which my family hopefully will use on a regular basis, and the Mill Street station. Uh, and uh, connect, you know, uh, major development sites like the, the Schneider's plant. Mm -hmm. and so forth. Okay, great. Um, because I think that that would be another, you know, avenue to, to approach this from when, yeah. we're, when we're looking at planning around the rapid transit station in that area. So yeah. If, if I may, um, I think uh, there's another huge opportunity uh, in this in that, uh, or that could be done in, in collaboration with uh, planning around rapid transit stations, and that is opening up the creek. Right now, it's pretty much a concrete ditch, um, and uh, it, it is the potential for a, a, a basically a uh, urban waterfront uh, within the city of Kitchener. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the, the uh, um, recreational and um, active transportation potential for, for both of those things is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you, and uh, please continue to uh, provide your valuable input uh, regardless of whether you're on the uh, Cycling Trails Committee. Uh, we, we appreciate it, so thank you. Thank you, and finally, we have Councillor Etherington. Yeah, Mike, through you, Mr. Chair. When I'm on the trail, if I'm walking or cycling, I'm much more likely to go the other way simply because it's more attractive. If you could do one thing to improve that south end or whatever you call it of the trail into that industrial area, what would it be? I think um, what would really be helpful would be some more uh, tree cover, actually. I know that's a very long-term investment. Uh, when you plant a tree, it's not going to provide you very much shade and not going to provide, you know, maybe blocking out some of the um, less uh, attractive buildings or... Um, or properties uh, along the way. But uh, I think uh, in terms of um, that uh, giving green space and, and greening an area that uh, is, is quite gray at times, I think would have a huge, huge impact. Yeah, thank you. And as you mentioned, the crossing at uh, Cortland and Sterling, which is horrendous. <laughs> One other question. Uh, I like your idea with the creek. There's so much potential with that creek. 
Were you aware that the same creek is actually buried on the Cortland, on the Schneider site? Um, I know that there are some, uh, I think there's, um, I mean, there's the one creek that runs parallel to the trail, but there's also one that runs yeah. sort of perpendicular underneath the Schneider site. I, I do remember that from the planning around rapid transit stations. Yeah. Um, and and did at that time recommend that perhaps we uh, we use the places where it actually comes up to the surface to use those corridors for active transportation routes as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, and thanks for your work. Thank you. There are no further questions, Mr. Bose. Thanks again for your input. Appreciate you. it. Okay. Our final registered delegate is uh, Mr. Harold Dritz. I have one copy for the clerk. <clears throat> so, Mr. Chairman, I just love your consistency in the rules of engagement to this evening. For several years now, you have changed the rules without giving adequate notice to the public. Although this year is better than last year, you changed the rules way too late and again this evening. I'll get into that later. This year's rules of engagement should have been put out to the public at least one week ahead of today and not less than two business days prior to this meeting. By the way, two wrongs still don't make a right. You really display how much you want the public input within these chambers because this council makes it more and more difficult for citizens to appear as a delegate by putting bylaws in place restricting when citizens can speak and I was going to speak on December 12th, and I wasn't allowed. Just wondering if uh, administration proofs reads for accuracy the, article counselor, the articles councillors read in the Kitchener Citizen. The Ward 7 councillor had tonight's meeting starting at 6.30 instead of 7. I'm also dismayed at the lack of respect the group of seven councillors has for the group of three councillors. What we have as a city Kitchener Council is not free democracy, but arranged democracy bordering on dictatorial democracy. In my opinion, most of you councillors have your priorities wrong. We don't need to spend money to showcase our community. People, especially from the GTA, come here anyway. We don't need to spend taxpayer funds for the summer games when they are most likely will pay for themselves. The taxpayers should not need to help the tech community nor developers. According to the Waterloo Region record, some local tech companies are being bought out by larger corporations and have their local office consolidated in another city. Yet when it comes to helping out seniors shovel their sidewalks, you take an all or nothing approach. I would have thought you would have come up with some reasonable compromise solution to assist seniors that need help with this matter. As one writer in the Kitchener Post stated, our city shall be judged by how well it serves the least among us. I know Bill didn't even acknowledge Gary Magnifin's the, Wards, the Citizen Award 7 that asked for this review. I want to speak about WSIB. To have people paying fees for programs somehow contribute to a WSIB reserve is worse than voodoo accounting. This is for all taxpayers. This is, not a this is a cost of being an employer, not a cost of a program or programs. W again, a WSIB. When do the city administrators know about this cost? Was it truly just before the start of the 2017 budget process? If not, this should have been brought to Council's attention as a separate item right after administration knew about this. Based on experience, I know many, many months of processing these claims take place before a claim such as these two WSIB claims are accrued or paid using whatever method, method paid at once or over time. If this information truly was just given to administration by WSIB, before the 2017 preparations, then I trust City of Kitchener administrators took 
WSIB personnel to task and asking them why WSIB withheld this libel information this long and why the city was not given a heads up well ahead of time. In summary, we do not think you should pat yourselves in the back with a tax base increase of 1.75%. It should be a 1.75% on the impact of homeowner schedule at the subtotal line level, which includes taxes, stormwater, water, and sanctuary, sanitary. I look forward to your questions and replies, comments. Thank you, Mr. Jewitz. Councillor Fernandez. Thank you, Mr. Jewitz. Um, you used a term that I've never heard before, voodoo accounting. What, can you give us a further explanation of what that is? That's uh, putting expenses, revenue accruals in, 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 in wrong places. Uh, for example, uh, again, as I said, WS, uh, WSIB reserve shouldn't be paid for people that use programs. Or, or if you have a situation whereby you have more than the budgeted snowstorms and uh, you're, you're already over in that account, and there's a, another account in the facilities uh, department that is under, um, uh, under budget, and then you put the cost of the snowstorm in that account, that's, uh, that's what I call voodoo accounting. Okay. I think I can understand a bit more about what you're talking that's about. That's not my term, by the way. That's, uh, okay. that's well known to, to accountants. All right. Thank you for that explanation. Um, you, you made some points about the WSIB and you, you posed some questions about when the administration found out about this. From your perspective or from where you sit, what do you see that we should be doing about this, the WSIB situation? I mean, you've worked in the industry, you've had yep. to deal with WSIB, you've had yep. to deal with claims. Yeah, and there's, uh, within WSIB there's, there's various la layers, uh, including uh, experience rating. Uh, which, which is very important. Now, I understand this legislation came into effect uh, around 10 years ago, uh, and I don't know whether it went back to the people that uh, were working in the 1970s, but probably went back to the people that started, uh, say, 20 years ago in, in uh, 1995, 1997. So with time, uh, it, it, it should be uh, obvious, uh, and WSIB should help administration in, in this regard, that uh, the people that are, are presently fire personnel, uh, eventually, because due to what they are uh, subjected to, uh, are, are going to in, incur this kind of uh, WSIB uh, claim, so therefore, uh, the um, cities, uh, regions, so on, should uh, should start providing, and uh, and I th I think your uh, your accrual is low, and uh, it, it it needs to be bumped up, but not with fees, and if it's if it's taxes, it, it's 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 uh, it, it is taxes, but then find something else that uh, that uh, the the taxpayer can't afford, okay, so you, be, because we are stretched. You mentioned the. Um the water and the sewer and the storm rates and the increases and, and that we shouldn't be so happy about 1.7 tax increase, but we should be looking. But have you not heard about our infrastructure um, deficit and, and the concerns? I mean, where would you sit on, on an increase on those? Well, I'm, I'm glad we don't have any more sinkholes in what we do. Matter of fact, uh, I'm, I'm surprised that we don't with the... With the, with the with the state uh, of the of the pipe, pipelines and, and pipes and so on that, that we have, uh, with the way uh, administration talks, uh, I, I would have thought that that, that would have happened uh, a lot more than, than what it does. So, uh, I'm not so sure that I believe their their assumptions. Uh, I, I I think they're they're on the they they want to get the thing done a lot faster than what uh, is probably necessary. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to go back to the motion that was done before. 
The point of order, I did get, uh, I did get uh, notification uh, from the clerk that, uh, you know, five or fewer delegates, uh, regular rules would apply, uh, two questions, four times five minutes each. And then, unfortunately, it says five to ten delegates again. I think that should be six to ten delegates. Half-time allotment, one times five minutes per councillor. And then the third bracket was 11 or more, and that is where there was only questions of clarification to be permitted. That is what came out to me via email from the clerk's office, supposedly approved by you. Uh, suggested by me, Councillor Juritz, and I... I'm sorry? It was suggested by me, that's, that's correct. Uh, and that's why I made a point of ensuring that it was a motion of council to be voted on. So it's not, uh, it's not a, an approach that I personally took. It was an approach by this entire committee. Um, and yes, there was a vote. I believe, recall, I believe the vote was something like 10 to 1. Uh, and yes, I certainly have tried to revise the method of public input over the years. I, I, I won't apologize for that. Uh, the simple reality is, is that... Uh, there has been years when count members of council have asked questions to the point where some registered delegates have left, uh, and that is the exact opposite point of this evening. So I have con I've continued to revise it, and, uh, and if, if need be, we'll revise it again in the future. And we did make a point of notifying all of the delegates that had registered ahead of time of the rules uh, before this evening. Okay. Well, you did a better job this year, but uh, it still wasn't 100%. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Singh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just um, touching on uh, Mr. Drew, on your comments as to where we're going to be sitting on the budget. Um, I agree, I'm not uh, ecstatic of uh, where we're at, uh, even though we've worked hard to ensure that the uh, tax rate increase for the property tax uh, uh, are coming in line below inflation, and that's due to hard work of this council and staff and working to ensure that happens consecutively as it has in the last number of years. Now, again, I'm not a p pleased uh, with the uh, uh, proposed increases to water, sanitary, and stormwater, so, but there needs to be a solution that needs to be found. I, I appreciate the uh, response you gave to uh, Councillor Fernandez saying that perhaps the, um, the estimates are overzealous as to when the infrastructure needs to be repaired. But aside from that, if you just look at an approach of uh, the region, uh, again, uh, we are just distributing the water. We're, a you know, more of a delivery access as opposed to the treatment uh, uh, of the water. The region uh, in the 7.6, I, I might not have my numbers exact, proposed rate for water of that, I think close to 4% is a regional increase. Now, when you say that for that water rate, it should too be at 1.75, I would love to see it at 1.75. But when we're dealing with the region who we have to purchase the water from, and that uh, a similar effect on sanitary as well, are you proposing we should tax support that decrease? Or what other proposal would you have in mind? Well, the, uh, the mayor knows that I do make presentations to, uh, to the region, and I'm not happy about that either. Uh, in a way, you catch me off guard. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been around here enough to that to to know that uh, I, I'm I shouldn't be looking at details when I make presentations. So on, I should, I should stay at the, at the at the ten thousand foot or higher level. So I, I I don't know how to answer that at some point in time. But again, I'm going to make the same com a similar comment that that, that I made uh, regarding WSIB. Okay. If there is something that needs to be paid, okay, and the parent, especially if, if, it's, if it's a government, federal or, or provincial government, uh, um, if it comes from there, it, it needs to be. But then we need to have a, 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 a better look at what programs do we actually need versus what is nice to have. Get okay? And, 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 and that's where... It's got to be balanced within that tax base, and I know that that is very, very tough, but that's why you were elected. Yes, and, and I, that's why I wanted to make sure that we do uh, take the opportunity. Again, uh, you have presented before council, and uh, uh, you have a following that uh, looks to you 
to advocate uh, on some perspective. So when we're approaching numbers, we want to make sure that we're concise and fair with them. Uh, when you speak about WSIB or just at overall efficiencies, how we manage our taxes, I think this council, with, uh, of course, strong support of staff, had been able to do that in bringing our budgets close to inflation. But I think that's where, and I encourage you to continue doing what you're doing and advocating to the region, and I think the, our public needs to understand that. Uh, much of the, uh, the increases to water sanitary are due to the regional increases as well, but I think it doesn't need to stop there. I agree, we need to do absolutely everything that we can to limit that impact to the taxpayer. I thank you very much, and, and can, can I suggest, unless, unless, I can get, unless I can get a report from an administration that shows the number of uh, sewer pipes and water pipes that have broken uh, from 2013 to 2016. Am, am I allowed to ask for that report, or do I have to get Councillor Singh to, uh, to ask for that report? There is, exist there is, that. is existing information that I'm sure we can circulate to you uh, regarding maybe not, actually we might even have the water main breaks uh, recently, but um, probably Can you more, get that to me? More importantly, we do have the listing of the age of the existing infrastructure, so we know how many pipes are, you know, say 80 years old as an example, so that... I'm sure we can I, I would really like to know the actual breaks as, as far as the age of the existing pipes. Yeah, that's important. But then okay. the assumptions, they are assumptions and they're not factual. Okay. And, and I would, again, I'm not, not to debate, but I mean, there's a whole area in there as well about whether the number of breaks is related to the condition of the infrastructure as well. Uh, Mayor Verbenovich. Thank you. And uh, thank you for coming in uh, this evening, Mr. Drewitz, and, and sharing uh, some of your, your thoughts with us. Um, Mr. Dewitt, you were, you were a, a professional accountant in, in your career before, correct? I was a CMA, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and as part of that, uh, at, your, um, at your company, were they involved in getting an annual audit done through a professional accounting firm? Oh, yeah. They, they, uh, <laughs> I don't know where this is going, uh, well, I'm just, uh, I'm not... Mr. Mayor, but, but yeah, we, we were... Uh, 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 a public uh, company. We had shares on the on the TSX, uh, and yeah. Okay, and but, so. Uh, but but you know, there's 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 different things regarding so, so uh, the, being an uh, there's there's different it's, di it's different being an auditor than a manager of of treasury or accounting. The the audit always always <coughs> states something regarding materiality. That means. A uh, hundred million dollars in, in a four hundred million dollar organization that is material, but if it's only thirty thousand dollars, that is not material. But I'm saying for 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 good management and so on, the the the, uh, the reserves and the expenses and the revenue should be put into classifications into which they belong, and that's management. That has nothing to do with with auditing. Okay, well, first of all, and just for, for the record, in terms of materiality, I can assure you that materiality is a lot less than $100 million at the city of Kitchener. Um, in terms of, um, I, I think, the, through that audit process, uh, your auditors did do various checks and balances in terms of um, the way you presented the books and uh, to, to where... Uh, different things were charged and so on and made sure that the books accurately reflect um, what, uh, what the state of affairs was in that company. Is that correct? There's no such thing as accuracy until a company is sold. Okay, I, I guess we'll have to beg to differ well, on that. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, can, I can debate that with you some other time, but uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of assumptions in, in, uh, in, in accounting. Sure, but there are, also, there are also very high standards that professional accounting firms There's general have, accepted accounting to, principles. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. And so, for the record, I just wanted to, to be clear, because you referenced voodoo accounting, um, I wanted to be clear that the city does get its books audited on an annual basis, and our city does get a clean bill of health on an annual basis. So I just wanted that to be part of the pub, public record. Okay, thank you. There's, there's no one else in the queue. I thank you, Mayor Rabanovich. You beat me to that. I, um, when we start throwing words around like voodoo accounting, I take that as a very serious charge. And to be frank, I've seen no evidence of that. So if you would like to bring any form of, any form of evidence forward in that, uh, I, I would be interested to see it, especially in light of the fact that, our, as the mayor indicated, our statements are audited every year. We always have a clean bill. 
Uh, I just have one question uh, on the user fees uh, going towards um, WSIB. Uh, where did you hear that that was going to happen? Because I'm not aware of that happening. I thought the user fees were at 1.75%. Correct. And then they the, were raised and then the majority of council raised that to 2% so that an, an additional 30,000 on top of the 400,000 that the city treasury said they uh, would have because of increased assessment. So I understand that 0.25% was going to go on top of the 400,000 reserve uh, uh, to make it 430,000. And, and, and I think that's just the wrong thing to do. Okay, and then just to be clear though, that is, that is not the case. The only suggestion to, to date unless some, as far as I'm aware, is the increase to assessment to the WSIB reserve. There was never any suggestion that increased user fees should go to the WSIB. Well, so I, I, thought I, I thought I read in the record, and I'll put that out there, sure. yeah. that uh, the 0.25% was uh, uh, to increase uh, the reserve by $30,000. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, there are, are no further questions, Mr. Jewitz. Thank you for coming in. I'm sorry? There's no further questions. Thank you for coming in. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that, that concludes the list of registered delegates. Uh, does anyone else, would anyone else like to appear as a delegate before council? Not seeing anyone. Okay. Uh, this, like, that would conclude our public input session. I'm not seeing anyone in the queue. Uh, so that concludes. The next step would be our final budget day, which occurs on, on January 23rd, where we will be getting some updated public input. And I would thank everyone for the conduct this evening. Thank you.